Oh, hey, how you doing? Um, uh, whatever they're having, it's fine. What are you guys having? Bourbon. Yeah, bourbon, man. Solid. I'm in. Um, so anyway, these are the questions. It's, uh, I guess some of them came directly from folks off social media. Some of them are like questions they, I guess they've been compiling for a while. They're pretty standard. I think we can work through them. So. So social media really legitimate questions then. You know, they're questions. Yeah. <laughs> Let's do it, man. Um, all right, first one, I guess. How do you weed through the real instructors sharing knowledge on the forums, social media, and YouTube versus the posers? <laughs> wow, just getting right into it with the, <laughs> the posers right out the bat. <laughs> um, I guess that means they think we're not posers. All right, well, I guess we're in the in crowd. I mean, it's a legit question. Social media gives everybody a voice. Unfortunately, those voices aren't always valid. It's definitely democratized any transfer of knowledge. And I think that it, it's good and bad, though. It's, uh, there's stuff on there that you can seek out and I think truly learn. But there's also this uh, default towards outrage. Like people just want to yell at each other, argue over like the most low stake arguments. Well, I think, I think when they get controversial, they feel like it, it gives them like a, a louder voice or a more valid voice. <coughs> yeah. Not necessarily true. Yeah. But I mean, I guess, I guess the real thing is, is if you don't know that person or you don't know the circle they operate in or what their experience level is, I mean, anybody can look good on the internet. I mean, you're here, so. I mean, well, yeah. that, that, that's proof no, that I said look good <laughs> on the internet. Yeah. Yeah, no, it's, I, I think that uh, it, it was a natural reaction to kind of stale content. You know, social media allows everyone to kind of do their own thing and you know some people have interesting things to say but they never had a platform before um, but that doesn't make you know everyone a subject matter expert as we've right. definitely seen too and you know Bob someone like yourself has a lot of experience how do you how do you sip through yeah how do you how do you make people on social Shit, media aware me hard. I mean how, how do you make them aware of of what your background no, think, is and what I your skill set is. I think the problem is. with the social media instructors or guys putting the stuff out there is well, anytime you get on camera, you want to make yourself look cool, right? right. So they're coming Wait, up what? with content. <laughs> Go ahead. <laughs> what, hair product? Yeah. They're coming up with content just to make themselves look right. cool on camera. You know? they, they so it's not stuff that makes that. sense. It's, yeah, you want to be popular, you want to do stuff that wow, wow is the customer. You know? Well, and that's the thing is, it's, if it looks sexy, it sells, so exactly. so people are people are elevating things up to the point where they're they're actually not based in fundamentals and they're not they're not valuable anymore. They're great on camera. Right. Yeah. It's cool guys. Which pictures. is dangerous as hell because Absolutely. now these guys dangerous they, as hell. They, they, yeah. get, <laughs> they get they get they uh, get they get well known as in good instructors out there. Well, then that's what guys are going out there. Other guys that are watching this stuff. They think that's the norm, and then start teaching that to all the general public. Well. That's scary shit, because now people are freaking practicing on shit that they don't need to. Yeah. yeah. I think it's something that we can see across the board with all culture in any industry is that we don't yet understand the effects that social media is having, um, because it does empower that amateur who maybe has something to say about a specific thing, but when you want to broaden his aperture and his voice, he maybe is you know saying stuff outside of his lane. I mean, look at like you know the fake news phenomena kind of a thing, where it's like, Stuff that is what's fake news. Fake, what's fake? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Not anything I watch. Uh, well, it's, you get content that is amplified because it's cool, not because it's credible, and this distorts the the learning process. So, yeah. like I know guys. That's, that's what I was. Yeah. yeah, that's what I was hitting on exactly. Like a lot of guys will ask you, like you know, hey, when do I do something cool? And you're like, bro, you're doing something cool right now. But their perception and their frame of reference is like, well, I'm not doing like backflips in a course and shooting a gun. This isn't fucking <laughs> right. cool, you know. Right. So it's it's finding that balance, and you know, I I think the biggest way you can determine it is, you know, what is the guy's background who's right, teaching right. you? If I want to learn, I, that's exactly yeah. where I was gonna go. Like, because you can't even it sounds work or you know, bad mouth and are bashing all these guys. In reality, some of these guys think that what they're teaching works. Right. The problem is they, they don't actually know know whether what it works, works or not. Right. And that's so, the thing. What's right. the validation? And I agree, I agree with you both. It's it's you got to figure out is this person really got the knowledge base to teach this stuff? Yeah. There's stuff I don't teach, particularly and specifically because that's not my specialty. It's not what I do. Yeah. Well, you're smart then. Well, I mean, most people don't do that. And, and I don't have as much of a dog in the hunt. 
So I, I can I can kind of back off and, and say that. But it is, I mean, like I understand the question, I get it. You know, with everybody having the ability to be instantly famous because you can be on the internet. Yeah. It's it is probably hard to weed them out, but I agree it's background, you know, and it's experience level. And I guess you got to you got to talk to other people. There's also, I mean, I would have to say that association, you know, yeah. good, the good instructors yeah. or the solid base tends to associate with one another or should. Now you know as well as I do, the A students the, hang out with A students, kind yeah. of a thing. Yeah. They do, but now there's a lot of little infighting when that happens too. You know, there's a, there's pokes and jabs, but there's a difference between pokes and jabs and fights. Yeah. Um, well, like any academic, you know, professors should be critiquing each other constantly, you know, but not everyone is a professor kind of a thing. And it's, with social media, we've seen like this allergy almost to even having a discussion about credentials, you know, because so many guys will do different things. And it's like, you know, I think a lot of people tiptoe around just flat out saying like, hey, if you're teaching gunfighting, have you ever been shot at? Like, let's just go ahead and th say that's one thing that you should probably, you know, be able to answer to. Right. Now, you can take that argument in a lot of different directions, but I think that's a good metric to use when measuring it against a guy's background. It's like, hey, are you opening your mouth and speculating about what's happening every single time you make a statement about, all right, when, yeah. you're, in, when you're in a fight and you're doing this, like, whoa, whoa, let's, yeah. let's, skirt, right. let's that's, back it up. Tell me about the fight you're in, because right. if you've never been, like, scared before, if you've never been, like, desperate, and you don't have a you know the breadth of professional experience to understand how everything could fall apart, yeah. then you know yeah. credentials might matter you know a little bit. I mean, that's just, just that's bit. it. Yeah, yeah, no, that is that's it. it exactly. You know, I guess that kind of rolls into another question because uh, I mean, there's no real order of these things. But somebody asked, what kind of experience should an instructor have to teach what they teach? You know, should a should a soldier teach concealed carry when that's not really his specialty, or you know, should a cop teach? something that's outside of his specialty lane. And I think we were kind of touching on that anyway. It's like, it, and, and that's, that's the problem is, is going back to that internet question about how do you vet an instructor? When we talked about experience, that, that makes a big difference. But it's also, you know, if you're gonna be an instructor, to some point, you have to market yourself. Like you have to build an audience and you have to have a teaching base. But I think, I think we talked about it, it's, it's staying in your lane of specialty. You know, Bob and I were having a conversation the other day at breakfast, and we were talking about climbing. I mean, off topic for tactics. We were talking about climbing. You know, absolutely not something that I specialize in. Not my specialty at all. Bob does it, but he relies on people that truly do it for a living. You know, we were talking about that whole culture. There's a complete culture of people that do that kind of thing. And I think teaching in the gun industry and instructing is all the same way as well. You've got people that specialize in certain things. And if people stay in their lane, I think they're good. I mean, we all know people that don't stay in their lane. So climbing CQB, not, yeah, probably. not in the future. Yeah. I'm not going to take a lead climber yeah. and, you know, do yeah. dynamic vehicle work yeah. with them. Climbing I is think. kind of like the new CrossFit, so there might you, be a lot of money. There, you know, actually, if we can get, get a shoe that. sponsor, yeah. you know, then probably people would take it serious. Reebok, I'm a size 10 and a half. I'm right. just, just take it right now. saying. Yeah, no, it's saying. it's one of those things where I think, you know, the, the quality of your exposure and the depth of your experiences. So, you know, look at like a like a PhD student that writes their dissertation on a very specific thing in a field of study, like uh, you know, uh, counterterrorism, you know, surgical strikes overseas. Uh, and now, could someone who writes a PhD or a dissertation about that speak about, you know, U.S. relations with Russia? Maybe not immediately, but they have the information base to understand how to research that stuff and build, you know, claims that can be supported with evidence. I think it's the same thing with training, where, you know, hey, if you're a 20 years spec ops guy. You probably understand firearms a lot now. You might have a specific specialty. Um, now, how much that specialty overlaps with material is where you kind of start to develop those left and right limits. You know, like if you're a if you're a free fall guy, and all of a sudden, you know, you get hit up by a department that's like, "Hey, can you teach us a scuba class?" You're like, uh, right. yeah. Like, no, you probably yeah. shouldn't be Figure doing that. that. Yeah. But that's uh, the thing. Somebody's yeah. So, <laughs> well, that's the, that is the problem with. I guess when you're looking at uh, experience-wise or staying in your lane, going with someone who's, because you probably saw it, or both of you guys, training pre-9-11 oh, yeah. to post-9-11, we didn't know what would work, right? Yeah. So I was one of them, and as a Ranger SF guy, I mean, we trained on some 
fucking weird ass shit. Yeah. Because that's what we thought, you know, like yeah. when it came down to yeah. it, we'd this be doing this, this, and happen. this. Yeah. yeah, I mean, you, right? But then, but then, and then after then that, the when you're when you're actually getting shot at, you're like, yeah. no, that shit yeah, this mattered. At least, at least yeah. the times that I've been in gunfights, yeah. right. Right. right? So I was like, well, all right, I'll throw that out the door, or yeah. you know, that's not gonna work. Well, that's I don't know if you guys bring that to the table when you're training as well, but that's well, I, mean, I, I, mean, I took all of my experiences. Found out what actually did work, and you know, and I was guilty too. Yeah. I trained on mm -hmm. some weird ass shit. Threw all that stuff out the window. Well, I mean, it, you know, I mean, some of some of the stuff probably pertains because you never know any situation. It's always going to be different. For sure. So, yeah. I mean, you should you should know how to do everything. But I mean, the majority of the stuff, I mean, just for me, it came down to shooting. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, well, it's tools. So, it's but yeah, I mean, we it was, all, we you, all use that term, you know, it's tools, going tools back, box. going back to like yeah. the instructors on the internet. You, uh, you know, I don't blame those guys because they don't know. And they're, they're trying to come up with things that are, all right, what's going to make me faster? What's, how is it going to yeah. be? Yeah, it's like, they have a very narrow frame of reference to where it, it is that danger of like, you don't know how close you are to like, you know, running the razor's edge with like, it's all about to fall apart, you know, kind of a thing. Or if you uh, put together too many complex techniques, and one thing falls apart, yeah, and it's like exactly. now you're just completely machine. screwed. The whole machine yeah. Comes yeah. Apart. yeah, and you know, yeah, you never learn how to play pickup basketball, which is what it you know oftentimes turns into. Yeah. Yeah. But yeah, I think that just because you know guns are very universal with a lot of tactical training, so a guy might think like, oh, I've never done like a lot of CQB, but I did it once, and yeah, I, I could totally really good shooter. Yeah, so I could totally do it. So yeah, probably, yeah, probably, yeah. Probably, yeah. Probably, you know. Yeah. I've never actually no, served a warrant or gone on a raid, but I, I could probably do it. And it's, uh, I, to be fair, I think a lot of those guys don't know how far they're bargaining outside their capabilities because, you know, they want to do business. They want to, you know, further their brand or whatever. And, yeah, if you're ignorant, you don't know kind of a thing. Uh, but now there's the Internet to tell you that you are wrong. <laughs> always to tell you that you're wrong. But to make you always feel like you're right. Yeah. <laughs> Depending which on, internet are you going on? on? Yeah, depending <laughs> on who's giving you feedback. <laughs> well, I don't even know if we answered any of that well, question. Well, actually, so this is really funny because this touches back to another question. Um, somebody asked, uh, what does the Warrior pre-9-11 look versus what the Warrior post-9-11 looks like? And what changed? Yeah. And I guess more to the point of, you know, I mean, I what does a Warrior look like? A, this is it. This yeah. is the new warrior, America. I don't know if you. Uh, no beard, no beard. <laughs> yeah. No oh, sleeve shit, tattoos. Yeah, no no full sleeve no tattoos. No sleeve yeah. tattoos. No. Uh, I don't got my sunglasses on or yeah. anything. Well, you got nice. Yeah. 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 yeah that's, so that's cool. Um, but I, I guess I guess really what they're I mean seems like what they're looking for here is is what changed yeah, and, that's and that's actually, exactly what you were yeah, talking about. That's a good about. question. And you you were talking about the same thing. It's you know everything works and we all know you know. A plan is good until the first shot's fired. Yes. Yeah. And then, and then you're gonna go back to your base because that plan just went out the window. And it's the same thing. So you, I mean, I look at changes and I'll look at it like from, from a really odd perspective, but the medical perspective. I look at what I did to train medically to prepare for combat prior to. Now, granted, medical wasn't my specialty, but it was a passion and it was important, and we did that cross training. But I look at what we used to do versus what we did after we started going into conflict. Oh, we would have lost people. Yeah, we would have lost people left yeah, and right so practicing same, those same, those archaic medical systems. Conflict changes everything. Yeah. It changes you as a person, but it changes all your all your TTPs, everything you're doing. Um, it's changed everything. Um, so I guess I guess when the when whoever this was that asked this question, you know, what changed? Simple, all of it. Oh. I mean, it, I I really can't think of a single aspect of what we did professionally, what guys like us do professionally. We drink have, bourbon, that's that stayed changed. consistent. Well, this okay, is this yeah, is stayed this is the only constant is that's, the uh, is is that we will get yeah. together to drink bourbon at yeah. any notice. Yeah, no, it's but I mean it's a legit well, it's cuz pre 911 you only knew what you knew. Right. You know, and you and we were basing it on conflicts that had that had happened in the past. Yeah. Well, now don't get me wrong, there's persistent elements of, of our organizations that stay relatively engaged. Um, and, and we get lessons from those elements. But for the general force, or even for the special operations force as a, as a, as a large entity, you know, persistent firefights, persistent engagements with the enemy, did, weren't, I mean, we weren't existent. We fought small battles, they were pretty yeah. quick. We did surgical strikes here and there. 
But as far as as, a, as an organization staying in conflict. Different, different area, different fighters too. Well, exactly right too. Yeah. So that. Changing environment, yeah. The whole colloquialism. So get, I mean, that's, that's your reference to go back to guys like that and say, all right, how was it? You know, what'd you right. guys do, blah, blah, blah. But different area, different fighters. I mean, that's all that shit. I mean, when I. It goes out the window. So I came in 87. Um, I mean, we had Vietnam legacy guys teaching us what we knew because right. they were in all the upper so command yeah, positions. Exactly. And how old is that? How many that? times did you go in the prone position? Uh, to like... <laughs> that was the thing though, in, in Vietnam, yeah. you talked to old Vietnam yeah. guys, they had contact, you'd be prone, From, you know... Yeah. Right. Uh, and now you're pinned. Send yeah. back, you know, well, freaking return fire, getting prone. Right. Well, you do that in the environment I was always fighting and that didn't work. <laughs> and honestly, if we all sat down five years from now and had this exact same conversation based on whatever conflicts are going out, you know, it'll change again. Or it should. You know, GWAT was the best ongoing ballistic lab that got yes. to validate a lot <laughs> of theory. A really, a really good way to put it. And I think that what you learn is, you know, you can't ever predict everything. If you, you know, guys would rotate in from like heavy street to street fighting in Iraq to, hey, we're in the mountains down in Afghanistan where you have to completely not only switch your mindset, but like the type of gear you're using, your loadout, like everything changes. All that theater dependent. Yeah. And, you, you learn that there's, okay, you can't predict everything, but there's a core set of skills that you can train to fall back on so that when you are in the situation, you're like, okay, I'm receiving this stimulus. I know I can do this. Like you said, like. Wait a minute. You mean people need to train on basics and not the cool guy stuff? <laughs> Wait, not. hang on. Hang on, Aaron. Wait, whoa, whoa, whoa. Hang on, Aaron. I'm up. Yeah. He sees me. Yeah. I'm down. All right? <laughs> well, that I can tell you doesn't work. Yeah, that's not cool. <laughs> It's not cool, but it keeps you alive. It's, it's like you said, like, do you go to the prone right away? It's like, yeah, um, you know, you react right away, I think, is right. what happened. Because, yeah. right? I know? mean, yeah, there is situations where you would have. Yeah, they were teaching I mean, us that that was the reaction, yeah. though. You just stay there. Like, yeah, it's like, no, nah, I don't want to stay here. They, not in the jungle. Yeah, they you know, know where I am. Yeah, yeah, They're yeah. shooting at me. Yeah. yeah. I'd like to be mobile. Yeah. <laughs> Let's see. This one actually came direct Instagram. Some of them say what they are, and some of them don't. Uh, what was the hardest lesson to learn for you, whether in training, real world, military, or civilian life? Hardest thing to learn? I think patience was a big one, um, just because, you know, and there's a, you can look at that a lot of ways. You can look at that on the battlefield, you can look at that just in the organization is, uh, the speed at which things change overseas is, you know, day to day. And a lot of times, you know, the bureaucracy or the organization you're in, doesn't stay at that same pace. So I think developing the patience to not burn yourself out or waste energy, uh, trying to move things along that won't, you have no control over. Right. And then just Accept, also- Accepting the things you can't change. Accepting uh, the things yeah. you can't change, right. yeah. And then also just more on the tactical side is, you know, that first you know few times you finally get in a fight and you're like, this is, oh my God, I've been waiting my whole life to do this. like having the patience to like, all right, like take a breath, don't. Let it develop. Yeah, let it develop, don't overcommit, you know, because uh, it turns out these guys might actually be pretty smart, you know, they're using flip flops and AKs and <laughs> slinging rocks at you maybe, but uh, right. you know, don't, don't, you know, over assume your abilities because you have some hubris behind your title or whatever, I'm, I'm fucking special, like, well. Well, I mean, look at first engagements we made, we were making yeah. engagements with people, granted, fighting on a different tactics, fighting on a different level, but those people have more experience of fighting. Yeah. They had been in more conflict than we had. Yeah, a lifetime sometimes. Right, exactly, because you, you live in one of those areas where that's your world. Mm -hmm. um, it's the only way to, to make a, you know, to have a profession. It's the profession to have. You wanna make money for your family? This is what you do. Pick up a gun and you work for a warlord. Yeah. And you intimidate people and threaten people and kill people. It's, it's a totally different dynamic from what we're used to in our society and culture, but that's their world. So, we, you know, we were facing an adversary that, that had done more of that than we really had mm -hmm. at the time, more than I had for sure. I mean, I can only speak personally, but, but you know, as that persistent engagement stays, you know, you stay active with it, you learn those things, but you're right. That, that overestimation, or sorry, underestimation mm -hmm. of your foe, huge. Yeah, you I, roll in there like, I, we're SF, like, uh, yeah. well. Yeah, 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 you are. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Welcome, welcome to the country. Yeah, you gotta, being willing to kind of adopt that in, uh, like inverted leadership role where you're willing to make yourself, you know, the lesser so that you can learn from someone else who might know more. If that's a, a warlord, or maybe it might be like a, a P 
PFC in the support section that did something before they joined the military and they have a valuable skill yep. in recognizing like, hey, I need to silence my ego so I can learn from this guy because he actually has valuable information. I think one of the big ones for me too was like interpersonal. Um, our organization is filled with A-types. Mm -hmm. We sometimes, no. sometimes want to choke each other as much as we want to hug each other. Um, and and it, it's a tough, it's a, it's a tough world to navigate. You know, you, you talk to the psychologists about what we did, what we do, and they'll tell you the same thing. You guys all fit a weird niche. You're like this tiny little weird part of a profile that doesn't exist. You're A-types, but you'll work with others in, in, the, in the presence of strong leadership. Mm -hmm. You know, without it, you'll eat each other or you'll eat other people. But, you know, you take that skill set and you move it to another country or you take that skill set and you move it to an embassy and now you're interacting with other folks, you know, mm -hmm. different folks, not like us folks. Yeah. Um, you have to know those interpersonal skills to be able to turn that on and off and be able to interact or else you're, you're either abrasive or you're not taken seriously or both. Yeah. Um, I think that was, a hard, that was a hard transition for me and I think that's one of the tenets of, of being an SF is having the flexibility. You're talking about going from civilian to... Or, or even going from a milita right. military advisor roles right. into, yeah. into embassies and things like that. You know, when we would do tours and... Just, just the interface you had to go. I remember the first, I had to go to an embassy dinner. Um, never been to any function like that in my your life. What, yeah, yeah, fork. yeah. 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 <laughs> what fork is this? Come on, we don't even have forks. Have cheese, want peanut butter, no? But I mean, okay. it's that kind of social interaction. You know, the ambassador yeah. wants you to, you know, greet him in the line when you come in and you got to say hi to his wife. And I mean, being nice to people is pretty easy, but these are also people you got to work with, you know? And, and I think interaction, those kind of interactions for us make it an easier transition because I made that transition, you made that transition, we make those transitions into regular life after the military and you know, whatever, you, whatever you want to call it's that. It's a relative term. Yeah, whatever the <laughs> shit that is. But having those correct interpersonal skills and, and understanding, you know, we, we got the benefit in our careers of having to experience cultural awareness at a different level than what most people do. You know, most people go to Jamaica to a resort and they think they have cultural awareness because they, you know, we're at the Sandals Resort in What's Jamaica. What's wrong with all inclusive? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> you know what I, I mean. like being able to drink the water at the places I'm staying at. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, it, it's, it's, a, big, it's a big point yeah, to me. Yeah, I'm, yeah. A, I'm a huge fan. That humility is, is so important, especially just once, you know, if you transition to the civilian world, because I think a lot of guys, they go from that, you know, highly concentrated and structured lifestyle of like, I'm around all type A's, I'm around people that are on the same page as me, I'm around guys that would do the same things for me that I would do for them. Right. And you go into like the civilian environment and you might overvalue. People want to eat you. Yeah, well, yeah, so they're, yeah, they're. <laughs> or that. <laughs> eat your face. Uh, but there's direct. Uh, being direct and wanting to, you know, be able to work on a team is very different, I think, in the private sector because, like you said, there's people that they'll smile in your face, they'll roll up their sleeves too to, you know, help dig the trench, but then when it comes time to it, they'll... You're going in. Yeah, it. you're going <laughs> in. Exactly. Yeah, so it's, uh, you know, just like you said, learning how to navigate those environments and not, you know, not ever being the guy that's like, you know, well, I'm SF, like, okay, okay, but who are you today? Who are, like, right. yeah, what is, like, yeah, got it, got it. You, you know, don't ever be the guy trying to tell, you know, clutching onto the high school football, telling right. stories about, you know, the heydays kind of I mean, a thing. You can't constantly do a Heisman pose? Yeah. <laughs> like, you can't walk around like that? Yeah, like, you know, put it, put it down and keep moving, you know, keep yeah. doing stuff. Be proud of it, but keep going. This one, uh, current warrior image, is it a Hollywood myth or is it real? What do warriors really look like? I think you know, GWAT made a lot of stuff popular on the recreational Firework side. Games. Yeah, what? so look at the commercial training community. There's this idea that you need to be a tough guy. You know, you, need, you know, like I got the goatee and the shaved head and you know, I'm always, you know, tactical and talking about guns. And I think some guys really yeah, play into this. That doesn't mean shit. Yeah. No, it doesn't. <laughs> and and it plays directly to, right now. <laughs> and it plays it plays directly back to SF's motto. Because okay, no, so tough looking. Right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Bullets, no, yeah. Just yeah. Say, the bullets. Yeah. The bullets do yeah. not. Yeah. They do not freaking care. But what, I, what I never saw anybody that? stop a, a, a bullet with a beard. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I can't grow one anyway. Mine looks like you hell. Mean my I look like my whole family's inbred if I grow a beard. But yeah, it's 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 you know it is it's an image. But I mean it's Hollywood. What's real? What's real in a movie? Nothing's real in a movie. So in our industry, you know, in order to sell a commercial product or service, okay, you know, yeah. image and yeah. brand uh, is important. And 
going back to what we were saying earlier about social media, where we amplify what we think right looks like versus what it really well, is. So it is going to change. I mean, now there's how many years have we been post 9/11? This is this is the image. So you're going to grow a beard. No, <laughs> but I'm saying so. The industry. I mean, well, before head, before 9/11, during you know during, they thought that's what it was because that's what they saw from the media feeds, right? Yeah. People with beards and freaking all this shit. And it wasn't because we wanted to wear them, you know? I mean, look at, do I have a beard on right now? Right. No, they're freaking dirty, they stink, they're ugly, and they itch. Why it's would I want a beard? <laughs> so, I think if you're I've talking about beard. image, yeah. uh, industry image, I would see it probably turning around. I, going towards the clean cut, doing everything, mm -hmm. yeah. doing everything right. It's not about freaking, you know, here's bunker, go, go assault bunker. Ah. Well, it's kind of like the term operator and like how it's so overused. It's, you know, it's, it's, I think we're seeing, you know, the next wave of thought leaders kind of yes. not really aligning yeah. with the, the tough guy stuff because. Well, it is. It was, if you, if you want to stay alive, you're, you'd be smart. Yeah. Well, it's not about exactly. it's like yeah. Yeah. <laughs> being the yeah. brute force. For being anything. a big dumb bullet yeah, magnet right. doesn't work so well. I guess it really comes down to when you look at warrior image, there really isn't a defined warrior image, but there's a perception of, of warrior image. And so it kind of begs the question, if people are trying to be that flamboyant or that tactical, are they really just overcompensating to try to cover for something else? Like either a lack of experience or a lack of something else, or, or are they taking it? There's instructors out there that have flamboyant attitudes and flamboyant ways of teaching and they're kind of over the top. They're not bad instructors. It doesn't mean that you're a bad instructor if you do that. That's their personality, that's their form of teaching. We all have our own style of teaching. But it kind of does beg, beg the question that, are there people out there that try to look the part too much? Or yeah. do, they, do they compensate by being so damn cool that somebody ought to think they're cool? I think there's guys that could definitely back it up. Like I, you know, there, there's, well, I mean, there's, so. It, Absolutely, I mean, if some people like beards. Yeah. yeah. I mean, no, if you're, and, if you're looking no, at like, image-wise, but I think there really is cool. But some of those guys lot. are the quietest guys I know. Like some of the guys I know that like right. have like the overt tough guy image who are actually tough guys, like the nicest dudes right. I know. Super demure. Super, yeah, yeah, yeah like yeah. not, like, you yeah. know, they don't need to check their ego because it's been checked for them through real life experiences. Right. And there's right. also like some of the toughest guys I know that you would never assume like that dude's And that's the dangerous guy. Kind of thing. Yeah. yeah, exactly. That's the dangerous guy. Yeah, so it's, Look at the way you profile people. You know, not yeah. that anybody profiles people. <laughs> but when you're looking at, when you're guy. looking, I mean, we, we learn it, you know, you pan crowds, you're looking for the threat in the crowd. There's no one way. There's no one guy. There's no one look. Um, it's, if, if, you base, if you base your it's tactical funny. ability on the way you look, your tactical ability right. is so, based I mean, on maybe, the wrong yeah. damn thing. That's gonna give you if that if that's gonna get you in the mindset, you know, like having the beard and the tattoos and right. what have you. If you've never been in a situation, but that gives you that mindset, like I'm the baddest motherfucker, well, it might help you, right? You know, save your life. Sure. You know, because it does come. Confident. Until you have yeah. bullets fly by your face, you never know how you're gonna react. No, no one does. No. Not one person can tell if they're gonna like it. Which until right. it actually happens. If yeah. that, if having that beard and those tattoos right. and all that is part of your, that. is part of your persona yeah, and it's it part might, of your projection, it might help. It might when it, when it actually does happen. For sure. But does it help you teach? <laughs> <laughs> right. If you, if you got your POI. <laughs> tattoo yeah. Right. right. Well, that's true. Yeah. So you don't forget. You don't need note cards. You just look really right. smart. Yeah. It's. I mean, like when I was like a, a brand new team guy. <laughs> Shot, shot, no, shot, shot, shot. Take off your shirt, Bob. We're doing body Here, shots. Here, Bob, I'm gonna do you a favor. I'm gonna fill yours first. <laughs> I wasn't ready. Yeah, you were. Uh, one more. You just thought you weren't ready. Audience doesn't know this is just apple Now, juice. Aaron, who drinks like a girl, clearly is not ready. You're here, take this. I only this. got You're one speed, man. I only got one speed. <laughs> Slow and steady. Do the tortoise. Yeah. Yeah, with nice hair. Gotta pace it out. Uh, no, so like, when I was like a cherry team guy, like, wanting so bad to prove myself you know i was like you know the like hot-headed dude that i didn't have like tattoos or anything or like tough guy image but i was just like you know looking for a reason kind of a thing it's so stupid but i think you know once you kind of grow out of that because 
your ego gets or checked. Or after but, you proved yourself. Yeah, or after that, you, Okay, I could handle it. I'm not know. crying this time. <laughs> <laughs> We're getting shot at and I'm not crying. Yeah, look Who's at big man I'm, now? I've grown. I've grown. <laughs> okay, but seriously, I'm really scared. Uh, no, uh, you, you, it puts things in perspective. So it's, you know, you, you, you don't, you start to look past that. And you're like, I don't need to, you know, overcompensate and, you know, not to bring it back to the internet, but it's like the guys are like, I'm going to argue with everyone. It's like, uh, yeah, I don't have to argue. I already I know the answer. Yeah. And, and that's, and, and, and that's not arrogance. Yeah. And don't get me wrong. There's arrogance out there. We all know it, but there is a I'm difference a between, money. there's a difference between arrogance and confidence. Yeah. And I think a lot of the abrasiveness that people get into and a lot of, the, a lot of the aggression they show towards other people, a, a lot of it is founded in the fact that maybe they're not comfortable at where they are. Yeah. Maybe they're not comfortable at their level. Absolutely. And, 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 and I get it, you know, there, there are people that have been in many more firefights than me. There are people that have been in many less. My confidence level, my level of achievement, my comfortability lies in the niche that I lie in. Mm -hmm. I, I don't need to be somebody else. I don't need to be somebody less. I don't, you know, more or less doesn't matter to me. I am where I am. That's my comfort level. Now, we always got to push to the other end of our comfort level or else we're not improving. Um, but having that tactical ability where you lie and based on your experience is, is, to me, one of the most important things. And I think people push beyond their bounds on that. And, uh, and, and there's really no reason to. Like we talked about earlier, there's phenomenal instructors at every level teaching all kinds of different things. Be comfortable in the fact that you do that. I'll give you an example. Our support guys, they constantly come to me and they're like, hey, you know, they used to come to come to us when we were on combat missions. They're like, you know what, when we get back, I'm going to selection, I'm gonna be a Green Beret. And I'm like, hey, that's cool. We always need good Green Berets. But I would ask them, hey, what do you do? And they say, oh, I'm a rigger. And I'm like, really, are you a good rigger? And they're like, yeah, yeah, for sure, you know. I've been doing it for years. And I'm like, let me tell you something. You mean a parachute Every time packing my American, parachute, parachute packing yeah, American that's true, is 2017. True, true, true. That is 2000. Yeah, we need to get more PC. But I look at those guys and I say, listen, let me tell you something. Every time I go out on an aircraft and my chute opens, I'm super happy that you're good at your job. I, I need you as much as you need me. So, and I think that's, I think people push outside their comfort zones or try to be something that they don't necessarily need to be when they're honestly probably quite good at what they do. Yeah. And, and I guess, I, I guess I always look at people that way, you know, are, are you comfortable where you are? Are you proficient where you are? You know, always seeking improvement, sure. But are you trying to be something you're not? Well, and what's the depth of the argument too? Like Bob, you uh, you caused the internet to outrage when you did your oh, video about the reload. Drop this one, put the fresh one in. Frick, why why would you do that? Do the reload. Yeah, there's just like the, 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 we're, we're, we're talking about a reload. Like this is this is. I think like, that's you know, on there, right? Yeah. So, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but it was just like you know people were like upset that they felt challenged, and I think that said more about them. Well, like apparently, I came across yeah. arrogant. Yeah. So that probably pissed people off. Well, so where's that line? Where's that line between proficiency and confidence and arrogance? Yeah. You know, everybody's always gonna have an opinion. So people said you were arrogant about the way you did, so what? It's a reload though. Like, who gives a crap, right. you know? Nobody's dying. Yeah. Well, yeah. how do you guys do it? I, I put the new bullets in the gun. In the gun, yeah. And, and yeah. then I use the gun. And then I use yeah. the gun. Right, and oh. I like to shoot. Uh, yeah. Well, I mean, okay, after, because I don't, I don't well, it's read that much of this, you know, forum stuff, or and I happened to read that, and I was like, motherfucker, people are questioning me on this. I was like, I mean, I no shit, I got on the phone and like called a bunch yeah, of boys, like, some how do you do a reload? I'm like, and they're like, well, you dropped the mag, you put a new yeah, one in. I'm like, all right, all right, I'm, I'm not yeah. fucking crazy. Yeah. Well, but like that's that's the scope of the argument yeah. where it's like, you know, I, I think that that says more about the person when it's like they're willing to. If they're willing to engage over something so insignificant right. as that, it shows where they're at with their growth. Agreed. And, Agreed. you know, it's, it, yeah, the, 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 the depth of some of these arguments, like guys will go at each other, where it's like, USGI mags are better than Paul Arbor mags. No, fuck you. And like, what? <laughs> like, this is what you're arguing yeah, about? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know? Do you have a job? Yeah. Do you have something to do, like, on a regular basis? Because yeah, yeah. this is dumb. <laughs> yeah. And that's the million dollar question right get out of your mom's basement yeah. yeah don't tell me to get cheetos off my fingers yeah i'll do what i want i'll do what i want <laughs> all right here's a good one i like this one so what's up with all the guys that show up to class wearing a ton of gear do they really need it oh, man. the, the gear queers I'm the worst well come on we're all gear queers i'm not 
I am the absolute. Are you a minimalist? Oh, God, yeah, I don't. Now, see, I say I'm a minimalist, too, and then I go through my kit in my garage, and I'm like, where did I get all this stuff from? Well, now, yeah, I don't I use I have it. a lot of stuff. Right, right, right. But, yeah, I don't. I don't. We're collectors. I am light and slick yeah. on, on everything. So. That was your nickname in uh, gym class, light <laughs> and slick? You're just, hey, oh, Keller's behind the bleachers again. <laughs> You're looking for a prom date. No, it, it, it goes back what, to- are you a gear guy? <laughs> no, well. <laughs> hey, Robocop. Sounds like you got a lot of, hey, like got a lot of gear. Uh, I, it goes back to that same thing too, like until you get in that first tick, you know, you get that first contact. You know, what you show up to in country day one and then what your gear looks like, crazy. you know, oh, yeah. month six, like it's completely changed. And Yeah, well, I'm not carrying this. Yeah. I'm not carrying that. I haven't used this in three months. Yep. <laughs> I don't need it. The, the, you know, utility of cool equipment that has very limited application, you know, like right. get rid of it right away. And I, I, it's a learning thing. You, you have to learn, I think. You, you have to go through that period where you want to buy new gear sure. because it's cool. It is, there is... And there's benefits to new gear, yep. for sure. Like, I'm not a guy that's gonna say, you know what, this thing that I'm using is the best thing ever. Nothing's ever gonna be created better than this thing. But but replace that thing. Yeah. Don't keep them both, and don't try to use them both. Well, it's like, how many holsters have you guys gone God, through? Was, like, exactly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And well, then you end like, up, holster? I just walk you, around with my pistol yeah, in my hand all the time. Yeah. Like, you guys don't? <laughs> <laughs> how are you gonna be in a ready status if you don't have your pistol yeah. in your hand? Well, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm of the same mindset. I, I, I keep things as simple as I possibly can, but I also try to look at, I, I try to look at options that have more than one purpose. We all do that. Um, and we do that because we've all been in situations where we had to carry, carry way too much high-speed, lightweight gear. Mm -hmm. Well, 120 pounds of well, high-speed, lightweight gear weighs 120 pounds. Yeah. If I can start to minimize or if I can start to have one thing that does three things. Yeah, well, it, then, and the, the problem is, then I'm, is people have never done it for real. Right. They see pictures, yeah. they see the movies. Well, usually more looks cooler, right? Yeah. Like when right. you have a looks bunch purposeful. of shit. Well, so pe that's what people think is the norm. True. Well, until you put all that shit on and keep it on for 10 or 12 hours, you don't realize Four weeks and how, weeks at a time. Yeah, how sucky yeah. it is. So Come here, Ranger. All they, do is, all they yeah. know is what they see on TV and what they see in magazines. So, you know, it's not, it's not their fault by all means, you know, by any means. They come to the class, like the first thing usually I'll do is like, you don't need this, 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 yeah. this, or this. You know, but they don't. You don't need that don't cell phone holster. <laughs> and even, and yeah. even keep, keeping that stuff on but for an hour or two hours isn't even that. I mean, you gotta, you gotta put it on at the beginning of the day. Lower keep it on all day and see if you wanna keep it. You know, that's. Well, it's, you know, it also says something about the personalities that are attracted to training where we associate harder with better so guys that might have all this bullshit on you know you're like oh man like i'm really sore but this is a good sore like no that's a stupid sore <laughs> yeah you know and i think that's like the military does a good job of like beating that into you with like carrying ounces not pounds kind of a thing right. with any the, the moment you have to live underneath the rucksack for like you said weeks at a time you yeah your world changes and you start to realize like oh there's a million different mag pouches out there but i just need one that gets the job done so find out what works for you kind of a thing right. am i blowing my chance to get a mag pouch sponsor probably right now probably it's, it's, yeah, yeah it's out the window so anyone right that now. wants to you know give me aaron's mag pouch <laughs> yeah. thing that's cool you know i'm still available i didn't make uh, any yeah, ugly no, that's, that's yeah. Exa it's exactly well that's how that's no it is same it's, way i think it's functionality you know, it, it really boils down to, is this thing durable and does it work? Yeah. Um, yeah. Beyond that, I, I don't need a bunch of stuff. Um, you know, okay, here, here's a good one. How many people carried that giant knife? Because you need that giant knife. To Man, open your MREs I see with. That, yeah, to open your MREs with. You know, when I could have carried a Swiss Army I mean, knife. You're going to piss, yeah. piss off a lot of people. No, don't get me wrong. That. So, okay, so, so I'll, I'll, I'll give my story. I have a big knife. It's a solid titanium knife. It weighs almost nothing. Um, to carry a big knife, I carry a big knife that weighs less than what a small knife weighs. It is a, and it's not a giant knife. I don't have a machete on my kit. I, I can see where you guys are gonna go with that one next. But I have a big knife because there are, there are things that I can use that knife for. I have a titanium knife because it is non-metallic, non-sparking, non-magnetic. I can do different things with it. It's very, very strong. Um, so. I have, uh, I have a tool that, that can, I can do multiple things with, but I tried to minimize, because it is a large size thing, 
a relatively large size to put on a war belt. I wanted it to be as I wanted it to be as light as possible, and I tried to look for other other aspects of it that could work. So, yeah. you know, it it's just because you have real estate on a belt or a vest <laughs> does not mean that you, you have to fill, fill that, that real estate, estate <laughs> with some type of a piece of kit. Yeah, but it's common, for sure. I mean, we see it. You see it with students, you see it with cops, you see it with all kinds of tactical people. Um, but it really comes down to, like you said, do you ever wear that for a long period of time? Mm -hmm. do, you ever, do you ever cart that up and down mountains? Yeah. Because it sucks. It sucks bad. I'd rather have weight on something that stops bullets than something that carries my cell phone. <laughs> or another water bottle. <laughs> I can only drink so much water. <laughs> Yeah, it's uh, well, we're gadget prone. Like you know, a lot of the stuff that's come out recently, you know, some of it does look really cool. Some of it is purposeful too, sure. you know. Um, and it, that gear-based solutions mindset is maybe not always the best direction to go in. Like I know a lot of the SWAT cops that I work with, you know, they will say, you know, readily that their leadership loves to buy them new equipment that they don't need, whether it's like some kind of breaching tool or some kind of like surveillance stuff or, you know, they, they try to craft a mission around like, we got to use that cool piece of gear and it's like, finally, yeah, but it's like, but, but, but it cost us another eight hours on the call out and, you know, like we didn't have to do that, you know, we, we could have done. So it's, uh, it doesn't, it's not just the guy at like the, the low level with too many pouches on it. It's a, it's a, uh, a mindset that can, you know, slowly deteriorate, you know, what your focus should be at you know, multiple levels, you know, different organizations. I like this one. <laughs> I know, I know everybody, like I know all, of, I know all of you guys and I know all your answers. So in your experience, how important is mindset? Well, that's a very relative, <laughs> yeah, what, yeah. What, do, what do we mean by yeah. that? Right. From it's, what situation? Yeah, in your, well, I, I, and I'm assuming they mean from a tactical perspective, you know, in a, in a relative importance of gear, training, experience, persistence, attitude, where does mindset fall into it? I say it's all encompassing. Yeah. I mean, I, I say that every, every aspect of what you do starts with a, with a proper mindset. And I think, I think good instructors train to that point. I think, they, I think they make you try to understand oh, yeah. the I purpose think. behind or why yeah. so oh, that you, you have it right. Everyone's mindset's gonna have to be different. And you're not, you might think you have the right mindset going into a gunfight if you've never been in one. And it could be totally off when, you know what, I mean, you know what I'm oh, saying? Because no, no one I'm knows how they're going to react yeah. until the bullets until the fly by their face. Yeah. So, I mean, you could have the best mindset in the world or you could be prepared, right. think you are. You could be the baddest motherfucker on paper and in your head. But when it comes down to getting shot at, you might be like, holy fuck, I don't like this. So wait, mindset wait is, does anybody like it? Mindset is <laughs> huge. I get really pissed off when people shoot at me. <laughs> yeah, mindset is huge, but right. is it going to work for well, everyone? So does it, ben does it benefit you in training, though? So yeah. having uh, well, proper I th mindset. I so I'll, I'll take it. They didn't, they didn't emphasize yes. it, but I'll take I it to a different, it can a different help place. Right. in a stressful situation. Right. I, I use it a lot to help guys look past, you know, getting sucked in on a certain task. So like. Like with pistol work, everyone wants to be the quickest out of the holster, quickest hand speed for reloads. It's like, yeah, that stuff, you need to understand it, but like, let's look past it to, you know, a mindset kind of aperture as opposed to just narrowing in on these specific tasks. Like, well, how does that task apply to whatever your mission set is? Okay, now let's work backwards from there to actually prepare your mind for success rather than chasing these different, you know, metrics that might have nothing really to do with how you'll react in that real situation well i think if you're talking training wise like yeah. getting the proper mindset i think you guys have had to have seen this like the or or felt it because i know I, I every once in a while catch myself doing it is looking at the paper targets as yep. paper targets yep that's a good mindset for training you know it doesn't totally relate to getting shot at but it'll help you when the time comes so having the right mindset of looking at a paper target and thinking that is a really a threat right i think it's huge it like um and i'm guilty of it myself sometimes i'll be, you know be shooting at the fucker and People. i know it's not shooting back at me so i'm like oh uh, you know right like the range itis well, shit you get caught up in the drill yeah. 
It's like now I'm training the drill well, instead of that, instead of training mm. the situation that the drill addresses. Yeah, yeah, yeah. absolutely, absolutely. Right. So I think that plays into the mindset if you're bringing it to the range and getting ready for a stressful situation. It's like focus too. Like if you're gonna, you know, be the primary jump master for a jump, you know, your mindset helps you go through a sequence of events mentally right. to prepare you for what you're doing, which is, you know kicking dudes out of a bird. Right, am I the primary, am I the yeah. AJ, am I the safety, what are my duties and responsibilities, you have to look at where am I moving in the everything yeah. as opposed to like, you can't just focus in on one thing, which you know, like on the range, like you said, like we'll get caught up on focusing in on one thing when in, in reality it should be everything as a whole and then what it actually applies to. Yes, mm -hmm. which that's mindset. So you just mentioned it and it's the next question. Somebody asked, does stress shooting really work or is it all show? <laughs> No. <laughs> so yeah, I'll probably piss people off on that one. Well, you but I mean, say, and you guys well, too. Le no, legitimate question. You know, it's but it's it's like you said, you get into that range itis, you get into that range mentality. There's no stress on the range. Now you can add stress by adding time requirements, accuracy requirements, all of those things that that make the range more stressful, but that's not real stress. It's a type well, of, right. it's a type physical of stress. Versus mental. Right. Exactly. Physical versus mental. And, and, in, and in all honesty, you really need but to I mean, mimic like, both. So, well, you guys, how do you guys feel on the stress, trying to create stress by running around, throwing weights all over the place and getting the heart rate up? Do you think that induces the, the correct stress for? Uh, Less is more for a real situation. Less is more, I think, with the physical stuff. So with, like, you know, I think that there is a misunderstanding that a lot of shooters have that is, if I get my heart rate, if I do, you know, 100 burpees and then I go shoot a gun, that was awesome stress-induced training. It's like, right. well, did you want to? Yeah, I totally disagree. Yeah, well, it's like, are you trying to, you yeah, I don't agree with that either. Are you trying to smoke yourself? Yeah. If I'm driving a vehicle and I start getting <laughs> shot at, I don't have any physical stress. I've got a ton of mental stress. Right. So. So people that do that, if you're doing it physical stress, then I agree like that, you know, right. you know what the, well, I don't agree because I haven't seen it on target myself. You didn't do burpees the first no. time. Well, we did, RPG. hell yeah, we did. I did, I did all that <laughs> shit. I did all that stuff, you, Lead, you, you know, pre 9-11. You fast rope in, you do your burpees. Uh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so you I don't know, but, but, it, but if, that's what, if, that's yeah. what, if that's what instructors are doing it for right. like physical stress, then I would agree. You I have would, to create a stress. I wouldn't say bullshit yeah. on it. You have to understand but how you creating, perform in Creating right. mental stress by doing burpees and yeah. throwing weights, or like, it, ain't, it ain't the same. Dudes that like duct tape their hands together, like you never know when your hands can be shot off, bro. Like, uh, you're kind of, we're looking at this the wrong yeah. way. Yeah. Like, uh, let's, yeah. let's, let's backpedal here. Let's not uh, train for getting shot yeah. our hands off. Yeah, it's, it's not it, Well, it's, okay, so guys focus too much on the physical aspect, and it's like, you need to understand what it's like to shoot with an elevated heart rate, absolutely. absolutely. But the mental stress is more important because the speed of a tactical engagement is very different than... You well, know, and it has ebbs and flows. Yeah. So it's, I, I think that, you know, we get so caught up in, again, like, you know, the harder is better kind of a thing. It's like, man, we ran a two-miler with our gas masks on, then we qualified. Like, Okay, but like, what was the learning objective? <laughs> They're like, what did you? Well, but see, I, I, I did shit like that too. But it was <laughs> yeah, all yeah. pre 9/11 yeah. stuff that we thought. Right. All that hard ass shit, like you're saying, harder, harder, not smarter. Yeah, or, hard, know, hard yeah. rangers, not smart uh, rangers. But that's what we thought yeah. was gonna fucking get us through battle. And then when it came down to it, you know, all that shit. So, so yeah, now if you see people doing it, I'd be like, you guys are some. You know, you're doing yeah. the wrong, you're, living, you're doing the wrong the thing. Well, it's like the first time you get exposed to it, you kind of like, all right, check the box, you know, and you're like, all right, this is what it's like, you know, my hand movements might slow down, but if you're relying on that specifically, like it might be improperly patterning you for the mental component, which you can accomplish through like, you know, blind shoots or force on force, right. um, you know, truly, I hate to say like problem solving, because that's such a misnomer a lot of times with which is yeah, a but, huge aspect but of shooting but it has absolutely. nothing to do with shooting yeah. tactical problems are <laughs> you know, huge yeah. mindset problems yeah, yeah. and they're huge you know mental problems as you're working through it's a tactical chess game yeah um and so you're you're working through it you know and it's that next move i think that if you're a you know if you're a decent shooter physical stress shouldn't really 
be that big of a hindrance because you understand how to control it. You well, understand how to control it. If your you're breathing. also in decent yeah. physical condition. Yeah, if you're also. Right. <laughs> and assuming you need to But, but I think if you're a badass shooter, right. it's going gonna, it's gonna to be less mental stress as well because you know you're going to win. Well, competitive shooters. Yeah. So here's well, a question Does competitive but shooting. Then that, that goes into can you get shot at? Right. Yeah. So does competitive shooting mimic? some of those mental and physical stressors that you would train for in a combat scenario. You're shooting under time, you're shooting for accuracy, you're competing, and some of those shooting events require physical movement. I have some pretty fat guys that are amazing competitive shooters. <laughs> I get yeah. smoked by some dudes in USPSA one, that are ginormous. Some I know some one-legged dudes yeah. that can smoke me in competition on any, yeah. on any day. I think it's great. So too, no. But you could be the, you could be the number one in the world and when it came down to getting shot at, you might you might out. seize up. Yeah. So. Yeah. I think it's good that you know the tactical community has gotten away from the narrative of you know competition will get you killed. You're like, okay, we've gotten away from that to see that there are benefits. Sure. But I've also seen with the popularity of competitive shooting, some tactical shooters actually start to like veer towards the bad sides of it. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, examples would be like a, a holster configuration. You know, just like level one retention. Well, it's like, hey, you know, there's not all. Holsters are made the same kind of a thing. If that thing flops out on the ground when it needs to be up against your hip because you're like running over walls. Or you catch it on every doorway. Yeah. Or you get into a situation where you go hands on with somebody and you've got this thing, protrusion. Yeah. It's, I think, good for a measure of mechanics, but if you're improperly. Well, if you're going to do it, I think they're great because I think yeah. where you're going with it with kit wise, totally agree with you. Like, you got to do the, the uh, stock class. You know, use what you, there you use, go. use what you be using. Well, I think practical, I think practical the, tactical or whatever the Well, I think you can do. I think it's called stock the yeah, stock I class. I think there's some benefits there. As long as you're using the stuff that you'd be using. Right. You know, how how you if you're yeah. if you're a day-to-day -day carry guy, well when you're doing those carry or those competitions, you should be doing it. You should it, be doing it from from, from how you carry. how you carry. Agreed.